Uh, may I request everybody, we are now going to move straight into the next session. It's our, it's our great privilege to have Mr. Um, Mr. Praful Patel, Honorable Minister for Heavy Industries and Public Enterprise, Mr. Montek Singh Aluwalia, Deputy Chairman, Planning Commission of India, Mr. Jyoti Raditya, Madhurao Sindhya, Honorable Minister for Power, and, and of course, uh, in, in the industry voice, uh, in the industry uh, leaders that we have with us is Mr. Y.K. Modi, Mr. Harshpati Singhania, Mr. Harsh Mariwala, Mr. R.V. Kanoria, and Nana Lal Kidwai. Thank you so much, sir, for all of you for joining us. The, we have a very interesting um, moderator, Supriya Sirante, senior editor of ET Now, who will take this, this uh, discussion of uh, industry in conversation with government forward. Thank you, Supriya. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, without wasting any time, we've got deadlines to meet here with all the ministers and the top corporates present. Uh, this discussion is all about industry speaks to government. I'll keep my position to bare minimum and just facilitate that discussion. Uh, if, if I may ask uh, the ministers sitting here uh, and Dr. Aluwalia to first begin with, what is it that they are hearing from industry in the last two odd months that has changed from what they were hearing initially? Uh, le let's begin with you and then I'll go to Mr. Sindhya and to Mr. Patel and then take this discussion forward. Well, yeah, uh, you've changed the subject from industry talks to government to government listens to industry. I guess, uh, um, you know, I think it's quite clear that the economy has been going through a two-year slowdown. And the dominant impression uh, that I get from industry is clearly, first of all, recognition that things are not what they were earlier. I think they also know that that's what the government also feels. Somehow their perception is that the, it's the government that should really do something about it. And the government also agrees with that. So the issue really right now is how do we end this slowdown? How do we get back to a better growth performance? That's what I hear. Uh, how different is it for, say, somebody like you? Uh, you, you associated with a sector where uh, top corporates come to you, they ask about uh, imports, they ask about uh, capital formation not picking up. Uh, has the discourse changed in the last two odd months? Because the perception is things are happening, they may not be reflecting on the ground. Let me begin on a lighter note. And that is... Right now you have stalwarts and heavyweights in this conference today from the Congress party and the BJP uh, speaking to all industry leaders. We are a chota party. We'll be relevant only after April, May. So <laughs> You're still very relevant now. <laughs> so after April, May, you can ask me more direct questions. <laughs> so that is to begin with. I said, you know, very serious faces here. So. But coming to the core question, whether things are, well, yes and no. Yes, because certainly there have been a lot of uh, major policy initiatives, a lot of the pending decisions, a lot of, uh, I would say, uncertainties, which have been cleared very decisively in the last uh, four to five months. And that certainly has changed the mood. But on the other side, there is a political uh, issue. People are waiting that what exactly is going to happen. There is that, you know, that cynicism, pessimism, and wait and watch policy. And that is why I think a lot of the major investment uh, decisions. You asked me about my sector. Yes, we have auto sector. We have heavy engineering. The power sector and uh, my ministry work very closely together. All these have certainly, you know, there is more clarity, there is more uh, decisiveness in uh, the way we mo want to move forward. But at the end of the day, since it involves large, major investments and in the core sector, people do feel that it is better to wait and watch. But I must admit that uh, there has been a great positivity and a lot of major important decisions which industry would like to hear, as they say, music to the ears for the industry and for an investor. I think the government's move and the way forward is, has been very, very clear and decisive. 
Decisive indeed. Mr. Sindhya, if I may come to you, uh, you've just come back from an election, so we were speaking about the cynicism in uh, electoral politics, but uh, talking about the power sector, plenty has happened in the last few months. Uh, do you think you've been successfully able to uh, turn the sentiment in the sector, at least from somebody, uh, from, from a sector where everybody thought nothing would move, uh, things are beginning to change? Well, two comments firstly. I, I am not a cynic. Uh, I believe in uh, the vibrancy of our democracy. Whether we win elections or lose elections is not important, but what's really important is that we have, as a country, the will to win. And I certainly believe that over the long term, India as a country is going to win and there's nothing that's going to stop her. That's point one. Point two, I, I also do think that, um, uh, you know, when bad news filters in, uh, whether it has to do with uh, a slowdown, as Montek Singhji said, or uh, indecision, uh, that, that has a lag period in terms of setting in. And once you uh, arrest that lag period, then on the way up as well, it does take some time for the good news to filter in. The last three or four months uh, uh, in cabinet, outside cabinet, there have been a, there's been a tremendous amount of traction uh, to arrest that downside and take India back onto its trend. What is also very clear uh, and I believe, uh, as a younger person in India, uh, that we all have to work together. Government by itself cannot realize that dream. Industry by itself cannot realize that dream. State governments by themselves cannot realize that dream. It has to be a working with all stakeholders towards a common goal. And we have to, to, uh, to turn this conversation. Uh, what I hear a lot on television and off television is what you did not do, and what you have done wrong, and you are corrupt, and you are this. We, why can't we go in and talk about the asset side of a balance sheet? What is it that we have done right? And why is it you must vote for us, or bring us back, or push us in industry? Because this is what we want to do. I think that positivity in our mindset is what India needs the most. Uh, I certainly do believe that uh, in the last 12 to 13 months, there has been a a degree of movement in the power sector. Uh, we've tried to turn this ship around, whether it w it's in the area of generation with regard to ensuring that uh, we get coal supplies in, uh, we tie up FSAs. There were 172 FSAs of almost 71 gigs that were pending, cleared that from, crack from cabinet. I'm sorry, 172 FSAs. We have signed 157 till date in a period of four months. There are only 15 FSAs of six and a half gigs pending as we speak today. Uh, whether it's the fact of uh, independent coal regulator bill that everyone was arguing for so that quality parameters of coal, delivery mechanisms of coal could be ascertained. We've passed that in cabinet. The very fact that you wanted third party um, uh, quality control check on coal. Uh, so there, there was transparency in a relationship between Coal India and the power producers. That has been put into effect as of 1st of October. On the transmission side, we have we are going to hopefully by end of Q1 2014 uh, interconnect the whole national grid into a synchronous grid. That will be the largest grid in the world as we speak. On the distribution end, we've got the FRP, the financial restructuring package that has been promulgated by four states. Bonds worth almost about 95,000 crores have been issued. Tariffs have been raised, something that power producers were arguing for. It will be an annual exercise. The fungibility of the balance sheet of the discoms have become much stronger. And I'm sure that these, all these measures and many more that I'm thinking of, reforms to the Electricity Act, changes to the tariff policy, many other issues that we are working on, even though we're going into an election, I believe every day counts, not necessarily only for me, for the Congress party, but for all, all of us as a country. Fair enough. Uh, Ms. Kidwa, if I may uh, if come to you, and because um, Mr. Patel here wants to leave, if you may direct a question. You've heard the ministers talk. You've heard policymakers speak. It gives us a sense that there's plenty happening. But what else does the industry want from the government? Well, it is at the end of the day about execution. And we had a very interesting session, which uh, in fact you conducted yesterday with the secretaries. And this term of growth fundamentalists emerged. And we were all on the same side. The bureaucrats were saying they were growth fundamentalists and industry was saying that we were growth fundamentalists. So what is the disconnect? Why are we not all able to translate our vision for growth to growth? And my question really would be uh, actually to uh, 
our Minister for Power because he has managed to turn the direction back into getting some of those projects back on the ground. At what was it that wasn't happening before and that is happening now? And the lessons therein that we would have learned to make sure we don't go back to what was happening before, which was stuck projects. So how, what would your lessons be back to us in industry, as regulators, as government, to ensure we don't get back to the stuck projects and all that uh, that meant in terms of cost to the economy? I can't comment on what was happening before, but I certainly can comment on uh, uh, what is it that I tried to do in these 12 or 13 months, and I don't know. Uh, the proof of the pudding is always in the eating, and I think that's going to be prevalent in the next couple of months as we move forward, whether actually the sector's turned around or not. But I think fundamentally what is important to me, um, uh, whether it's been in this portfolio or the portfolios prior, is I think what we must try and understand uh, is that we are not sitting on opposite sides of the table. We're sitting on the same side of the table. Because if you succeed, we succeed. If we succeed, you succeed. And I think that is uh, a very important lesson that, that I've imbibed through the last couple of years of being in government. Uh, and it's always been my effort to make sure that I listen to all stakeholders. Uh, I remember in uh, my first uh, stint as uh, uh, Minister of State in Telecom and Post, I have uh, Piyush Pandey who's sitting over here and uh, I brought him on board to do a BPR exercise and a remarketing of India Post, uh, brought McKinsey on board to help me. Uh, of course, I ended up paying them nothing because I'm a cost center, not a profit center, uh, but that's a different story. But I, I think it's, it's important to display the passion. I think in life, if you have passion about something, and you want to get something done, willy-nilly, if you keep at it, so passion, perseverance, and commitment, and transparency, it must be clear to the other party, whoever the other party is, that you're listening to them, you understand what they're saying, and then you must communicate what can be done, and what can't be done, and why is it that it cannot be done. And I think if you're able to communicate that, then I think all the people will leave the room in a, in a much happier mood, whether their work gets done or not. And I think that's what we've tried to do with regard to the SBDs, with regard to the advisory group that I've set up, where we've actually heard all stakeholders, not only the private sector, the government sector, uh, the environmentalists, uh, across the board in terms of articulating a policy forward. And then once you've, uh, you've heard everyone, you've discussed ad nauseum, at the end of that, you must take a decision. And once you have taken a decision, you must execute, and you must execute within a defined time frame so that people can see the results of what you wanted to do. Uh, that's a fair point. But Mr. Patel, if I may point to you, uh, execution is key. The question then is there is no lack of intent. It seems to be all well intended. Uh, is there a disconnect between intention and execution? And that is where the trust deficit between industry and the government really came about? Well, I, is it working? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think. Uh, I appreciate what uh, my friend Jyotiraditya just mentioned about uh, trust and execution. Well, I think, uh, yes, it's a combination of both. But I think somewhere where we went wrong, and we must admit it, is that we failed to defend some of our own policies. When it came to the 2G issue, we failed to defend why the policy, as it stood, was good for the country. And if at all there were areas of implementation which were, were not politically or uh, right or transparent uh, enough to pass any test, I think those could have been addressed. But we ended up not defending the policy itself. Look at the coal issue. I think the coal allocation, just now what Jyoti Raditya said, we have to give coal to somebody who's setting up a power project. We have to give coal to somebody who's setting up a steel plant. And I think we failed to defend the allocation of coal, per se, we went on, we're, you know, running around in circles trying to, you know, uh, justify to people in various different ways. I think we should have been bold enough to take up and issues and say that, yes, this is, we call a spade a spade. We have done what is right in the interest of the nation, in the, in, in the interest of industry. And what we are now saying is, again, going back to what we should have said earlier. So the net result is that we've lost a couple of years, and this has set, uh, I would say, a kind of a... Uh, a, a, a cascading effect on the entire system 
when you talked of secretaries meeting yesterday and discussing and looking at ways forward, I think absolutely it's interesting because both sides, the bureaucracy and the administration, and as well as the political executive, have to work hand in hand. But as a result of the last three or four years of, uh, I would say, miscommunication, lack of trust, or lack of defending policies of the government, the bureaucracy has also gone into a shell. And I think this is something which we all see, any government, it's not a question of government of today or tomorrow, I think government, the political executive, must be able to drive change. And that's only going to be possible when you instill that sense of confidence in the people who deliver and execute, that we are standing behind you. We've taken a well-judged, well-principled decision, and we stand by it, and we want you to implement it. And if there is anything coming in the way, we will make sure that we stand behind you. I think this lack of the last three years have somewhere we have lost the direction on this count. And that has cost the country dearly, has cost us politically also. I mean, there's no denying the fact. I mean, if anybody tries to, you know, uh, just uh, shield anybody, I think it's wrong because at the end of the day, it's politically cost us as a UPA also very expensive. And therefore, we need to correct this perception. And I think it's important. We work on it fast, decisively. And I'm happy, as I said earlier, that there have been winds of change, positive winds of change, and I only hope that this momentum continues and we are able to build back the confidence. When it comes to exec <coughs> execution, I appreciate what Jyotir Aditya is saying. I'll just go back into a flashback. I'll just take you to UPA 1. I'm not trying to say because I was heading the Ministry of Civil Aviation, but when we wanted to get things right, in the span of five years, the entire entire infrastructure on civil aviation got implemented. It was, I mean, I used to jokingly say to many people that very rarely does a minister does the Bhumi Pujan as well as the inauguration of an airport. In India, the Bhumi Pujan is done by one minister and 10 years, 15 years later, 20 years later, the fourth government does the inauguration. But we used to have that implementation and thanks to Montek, he's right here and I must acknowledge the Planning Commission and ourselves worked very closely on this. The Prime Minister's office worked very closely on it. And we did get the results. So it's not to say that execution or implementation of major complex infrastructure projects is difficult. And I'm happy that Jyotiraditya Aditya has taken on the mantle of the Power Ministry. It needs a fresh mind, a decisive mind, and an energetic mind to be able to bring that transformation. And that's what is visible now in the last few months. What he's talked about the power sector, I am closely associated with that as the Minister of Heavy Industries because the power equipment and the heavy engineering, the EPC, all comes under our ministry. And I see the change, the way things have started moving, and I think this is what exactly India needs. Fair enough. I'm going to take a cue from what you said. Uh, and Dr. Alwali, if I come to you, he said there seems to be a problem and there has been, and you were rather candid to admit, it has cost you politically as well. Uh, the lack of communication of policies. Uh, two questions to you. Uh, how difficult is it now to defend policy making in India, to defend your decisions with all the noise and the cacophony around decision making? Everything seems to be up for scrutiny. Everything is on public, uh, under public glare, on the public's radar. Uh, how difficult is that process now? Personally, I don't think it's difficult at all. I mean, there is no alternative to explaining policies. I mean, there are policies, and we are sure they're good policies. We should explain. That's not the problem. I think what we are discussing is actually quite interesting. And without going too much into the past, two things are very important. One is that the way government functions, it tends to function in silos. And when it functions in silos, any process requires different people to agree. It, it doesn't function as if there's a team that says, we've got to get this done. I'm sure that there are problems. Here and there, maybe the environmental aspect hasn't been looked after. Maybe some regulatory aspect hasn't been looked after. Can you take a consolidated view and make whatever adjustments are needed and come out with a success? That is not the way governments work. And I think we need to rethink that. Even within a government, I mean, a file moves from level one to level two to level three to level four. Everybody comments on it at level one, level two, level three. By the time it gets to level four, the poor fellow 
uh, could subsequently be made responsible that how come you con contradicted what somebody at level one is doing, whereas actually it's well within his rights to do so. This is confused a little bit, well, by a general lack of trust. That's true in governments all over the world. I mean, right now, globally, this is happening. But, you know, I think there is this one thing if you have a political attack on policy. That's what there should be. But when you have a sort of so apparently statutory bodies putting their own uh, criti criticisms of policy, that is their right, and they should do that. I'm referring now, for example, to the CAG. What is not being realized is that a pronouncement by the CAG is not a pronouncement by the Supreme Court. When the Supreme Court says this is the law, whether you like it or not, that is the law. And you have no alternative but to go and amend it. I think there's a judgment of the Supreme Court, which I'm going to quote now, where two judges have pronounced on the fact that they seem to find a tendency in the press to view statements in a CAG report as if they were gospel truth. And they have gone out of their way to say that the CAG is a constitutional authority, its report is a useful input into policy, it should be considered by the PAC. It is the view of the PAC that then prevails, and subsequently it is the view of the parliament that should come. Instead, what we've got is a huge desire to pick up anything which looks critical, and that gets built up. So actually what is happening is decisions are getting politicized, publicized, and mediaized well before the final position is taken. And that has caused the bureaucracy naturally to step back. And I think Prime Minister has referred to this in various statements that he's made. So looking ahead, we do need to address this issue. That is, by the way, why the Cabinet Committee on Investment and Infrastructure was set up. In fact, when we got the plan approved a year ago, we specifically said decisions are being delayed because of a silo-like treatment. And that is not going to work, and we need a holistic view. And we need to organize government in such a way that a holistic view is taken, and that's what the Cabinet Committee on Investment does. I mean, uh, all these references that have been made to decisions taken, uh, fuel supply agreements cleared, etc. many of the critical interministerial differences were resolved by the Cabinet Committee on Investment. So actually, in retrospect, had we set up the Cabinet Committee on Investment a year ago, we'd have been much better off. But you know, these things take time in a system to do. And, but they're very important for the future. Big projects have really been cleared by the Cabinet Committee on Investments, and if I may... Uh Okay, Mr. Patel is going to take her leave. Thank you very much uh, for being with us. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry I have to leave. I, I, I'm not the civil aviation minister anymore, so I can't delay a flight. <laughs> thank you very much. We'll carry this discussion forward and let me bring industry on board on this particular question uh, about CCI. It's, it's a very well intended, again, a very Nobel uh, thought, a very Nobel plan. You've actually cleared a whole host of projects, 287 uh, at last count. Uh, if I may bring this to Mr. Modi, uh, just from an industry perspective, uh, it's a well-intended move. They've cleared projects, but investments are not breaking ground. What is keeping industry away now? Your projects have been cleared. Uh, you will eventually get clearances from this. My question then is, is there a problem with the last mile connectivity in India? Uh, whether it's in policy making or it's in execution, do we miss that last mile? I think we, we don't only miss the last mile. It looks, it appears to investors like me and many of others that until unless government's focus is on investment and employment, which we feel at least it does not appear to be, it is very difficult to put investment in place. And I'll give you a reason. It is very good to have a cabinet committee approve the project. Now, if I am giving a project, it may take me three years to get the first approval of forest department, tribal department, pollution control, environment control, before I can put a brick on it. The same thing in various advanced countries can take one month. There they can be rules set, I am supposed to do 100 things. And I start my work. If I don't do 100 things, you can take my license, put me behind bars, do whatever, take action. But you don't allow me to work. So the issue is, at the ground level, unfortunately, things are not changing. And if they are changing, they are changing for the worst. 
earlier the environment clearance was taking three months to six months. Now it can take three years. If you go for land now, it is becoming much more difficult to get land than it was before. So I think the intention of everybody is to get the things going. But until unless we are asked where, where my shoe is pinching and that is removed, then only I can invest. Just, I am not going to invest because India needs investment. I have to invest because my shareholders and everybody will get the return from it. And if they don't get, it will be very, very difficult for people to invest. And I may add, if we Indians don't invest in India, to expect a foreigner to come and invest is, according to me, looking, it is foolhardy to look. You know, uh, it's a little ironical. I'm going to be the devil's advocate for just a moment here because you spoke about foreign investment versus domestic investment. No, uh, Unilever, Pepsi, investment. Vodafone, no, they're all no, investing no, no, in let, India. Let's, let's me, you know, you are investing in consumer goods. If Pepsi-Cola invest, Coca-Cola invest, Nestle invest, my friend Mariwala invest, yes. But are we looking at only investment in consumption? Or are we looking at no, investment in infrastructure, oil and gas, coal, iron ore, all those things. Mr. Sindhya, you made a point about advisory uh, committees, advisory panels, getting industry on board, listening to stakeholders. You're doing that in power. Uh, Mr. Modi made a point about the government doesn't know where the shoe is pinching industry. Uh, do you think that's not happening enough across the government? No, I, I didn't mean about power. No, I said, I said you've done enough on power. Uh, I think first thing, um, I think it's very important in life to be able to take constructive criticism and I, irrespective of good intentions and what you're trying to do if something's not working, I think it's important to uh, hear more and talk less. And I think that's something that I've been brought up with. Uh, so I think it's always, there's always room to improve. Um, having said that, uh, uh, I, I can only give you the example of what, what I've been trying to do over the last uh, 12 months. The advisory group that I've set up uh, and this is one of the key tenets that I put forward prior to anyone uh, uh, agreeing and acquiescing to becoming part of this advisory group is I said that very clearly I do not want names. I want people who can give time and people who can give commitment. And I'm going to discuss with you threadbare on every single issue. My advisory group which encompasses not only industry but ex-secretaries of coal, ex-secretaries of environment, ex-secretaries of power, uh, uh, Mr. R.K. Pachori from Terry, uh, a number of the PSUs. In the last 12 months, we have had eight meetings. The next meeting is scheduled on Christmas Eve, 24th of December. Uh, we, meet, we have met for three hours where we have taken on every meeting only a single topic. And so I moved from coal to gas to hydro to the standard bidding documents to changes in the Electricity Act uh, to issues on transmission, issues on grid security. And at the end of that meeting, it's just not another tete-a-tete. -tete. At the end of that meeting, what is clearly articulated is this is what I'm expecting you to do. And the advisory group clearly articulates that this is what they are expecting me to do. And therefore, at the next advisory group meeting, it doesn't start with, okay, now what's the issues on the transmission sector? The first item on the agenda is the action taken report by the minister to the advisory group on the points that we had very clearly articulated. So I'm as accountable to the advisory group as members of that advisory group are to themselves. And I think that very clearly sets the tone of what we need to do in terms of execution. Point one. Point two, with regard to the CCI, I, I've been part of the CCI. And it's been tremendous, as Montek Singhji said, in terms of the traction that they've been able to achieve. And to uh, Modiji's point, I'd like to also highlight that the CCI does not only approve projects. The CCI is not another FIPB. The CCI takes up projects which are stuck in a particular ministry on particular issues, debates them, and takes the decision. And therefore, issues such as environment clearance, issues such as forest clearance, for example, there are many power projects that I have taken to the CCI for exactly that. Clearance of EC, clearance of FC, basin-wise studies, the first project in a, hydro, uh, in a hydro basin which needs to be cleared ASAP. And the CCI adjudicates on that, passes orders and then those approvals are then released. So it's, it's a one-window shop, which I, I hear Mr. Modi, 
uh, is very important in our country to set timelines. Otherwise, people get tired. Industry will get tired. Uh, I, as a public servant, get tired. If you're keeping on peddling files, it doesn't give me any satisfaction. And therefore, even with the Environment Ministry, I'm working with them to actually come up with a set of timelines for EC clearance, FC clearance at the state level, for transmission projects, for thermal projects, for distribution projects, and EC, FC clearance at the central level, so that you have a very clear, defined timeline, very much of what you were saying, wherein an investor knows that if I, if I don't get this clearance in 30 days, then maybe we should take it as deemed clearance. And that's something that I'm trying to explore so that people are accountable in government, in bureaucracy, as much as we want people to be accountable in the private sector. Uh, fair enough. If I may pose this question to you, it almost seems that there is a certain perception that corporate India or people who look at Indian economy seems to, uh, seem to have built about the country, about the economy, about policy making. Uh, the truth lies somewhere in between. The reality is not as bad. Uh, is, is this a perfect case of perception being worse than reality? I don't think so. I, first of all, I believe that India has the entrepreneurial talent to actually take the country forward. I mean, sometimes I compare this analogy to, you know, rivers flowing down from the mountain. Ultimately, they have to flow into the sea, but the route which they take could be meandering. And I think some of the issues which we are discussing today is really the route that we are taking and not where we wish to reach. So there's no doubt that we wish to reach and make India today a country which can be proud of uh, its entrepreneurial talent and its business talent. But I think the problem lies that in trying to solve our problems, we tend to look at it uh, once the problems are created rather than trying to solve them at the grassroots level. So if I am allowed to take the point which Montague made about silos, I think that's a very, very critical point because ultimately what is happening is that the silos are creating subplots and they create these subplots without looking at the total plot. And I remember about 10 years back, The Economist magazine had described India as a country full of subplots with no plot at all. And I think this somewhere embodies the system that we have. And that results in the need for creating organizations like the CCI. Personally, I think there should be no need to create an organization like the CCI. The CCI is merely embodying that there are issues in coordination which need to be resolved at the grassroots level and not at the level of having to create such organizations which are uh, constantly looking at dousing fires rather than actually not allowing the fires to be lit in the first place. So this, I think, is a very critical point. And as far as policy making is concerned and as far as the total plot is concerned, actually I'm going to read out from a, a small article which was written by George Osborne, who is the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And I think this, in the simplest of languages, embodies what India should be doing. And he says that the way to avoid the fate of resigning ourselves to eroding living standards is to acknowledge two premises about the modern economy. First, we are not going to get richer by borrowing more from others in the world just so that we can buy the things they make. We have to earn our way in the world by making our countries attractive to overseas investment, better educating our workforces, and providing a climate in which our businesses are able to produce goods and services of sufficient quality and that the rest of the world wants to buy them. Second, our governments have to live within their means and not pile up deficits and debts that will burden future generations with the taxes to pay for them. We have to reduce entitlements and drive value for money through government so that we can focus public spending on areas likely to enhance our productivity. I think this what embodies really what business would like to see is that all our policy making and all the enablers which allow those policies to be implemented should be done in such a manner and in a positive manner, not to, not to counter the negative impacts of policy, but only to look at the positive impacts of policy. And I think what is happening and what is creating this trust deficit is that a lot of our laws are being made uh, with the idea that somebody is going to misuse them so they should be made more and more difficult. And that, I think, needs to go away. This 
uh, we need to look at how to build the nation and how to allow business and industry to flourish. And I'll take YK's point, allow Indian industry to invest so that, I mean, we set an example for other from overseas to also come and invest in our country. Fair enough. Mr. Singhani, if I may come to you, uh, it almost seems to be a case of policy making, according to Mr. Kanoria, is more reactive than proactive. Uh, do you concur? You know, I think uh, the first point I want to make is that I don't think we need more policies or many more. I think we need execution. I mean, there can be n number of new ideas on the table, but let's do something about what we have and do that more effectively and efficiently. The second way that I look at it from a business uh, viewpoint and filter is let's ask this question of every policy decision that we take or indeed of every executive action. Are we making it easier to do business or more difficult to do business? Another way of looking at that coin is are we making our businesses more competitive or less competitive? By, by we, I mean Indian businesses. And I think in business, one of the things that we face in Indian business is we are unfortunately receding on our competitiveness when we look at global things. Today, the cost of, let's say, logistics, the cost of freight of moving things within the country is so high. And uh, Mr. Sindhya would know this because he deals with issues of, of you know, in the power sector, coal, etc that sometimes it's easier to just bring in stuff from outside. And I'm not referring to coal alone, there's a whole lot of stuff. I mean, we are finding that in our cement business, we're importing gypsum from Oman. We are bringing in limestone from Vietnam for our paper business. Now, I don't think we have a lack of those minerals in this country. I think since 2007 or 2009, there's been not one single limestone mine cleared for the cement industry. We are having to import wood into India in 150 year old paper industry for the first time. Now the issue therefore is are we finding it easier to do business or is it more difficult? And I think that's the, the lens through which we need to view all policy making. And uh, I mean I, I can go on, I mean there are many issues. We have to talk about, we haven't talked about labor reforms. We haven't talked about the fact that once on the one hand we want our national manufacturing policy, our honorable minister just went and said that, uh, you know the prime minister said we want 25% of our uh, of, of, the, of the GDP to come from there. But we are moving into a situation where large businesses are saying we want less labor because it's difficult to, to handle labor. So we need to address a whole lot of these things if we want to, if we want to really get down into, into, um, into that. All right, there's a price each one of us pays for running late and behind schedule. I'm going to take the last question to Mr. Mariwala. You belong to a sector which, has, which is immune to uh, a slowdown, the consumption space, uh, and, and which is why I'm going to ask you the whole sentiment question. Uh, you know, reality set aside, it has a lot to do with sentiment, whether it's investment, whether it's growth, whether it's trust. Uh, what will it take to revive that particular space? What will it take to revive sentiment? I... I think you asked me about my sector or are you talking of the sentiment I'm in the talking country? about sentiment in general. I think ultimately growth is the only solution to improving sentiment and we need to grow at a much higher pace. Clearly we've had in the past agricultural revolution, we had IT revolution and we need now infrastructure and industrial revolution. As mentioned earlier by Anand Sharma, I think industry has to increase its contribution to the overall GDP growth rate and unless that happens we will not be able to provide jobs to youth. Instead of having a demographic dividend, I fear it will be demographic liability, you know, and that we should avoid that at any cost. I'm uh, glad somebody refers to the demographic dividend that could perhaps be the demographic liability. Completely out of time here on uh, this panel discussion, and I hand it over to you for your final comments. Oh, no final comments, then we're completely behind schedule. Thank you, each one of you, for being here. It was a pleasure. Fabulous uh, discourse. Thank you very much. Uh, may I just request our president to kindly give a, a green certificate to Honorable Montek Singh Ji, uh, our, our typical Fiki tradition of, of uh, trees being planted uh, in his name, and a green certificate to Mr. Jyotir Aditya Sindhya from uh, President uh, Fiki, uh, also in his honor. Thank you very much. Trees to be planted in your name, sir. That was a fabulous uh, intercourse. Thank you, everybody. Kindly remain seated. We are moving straight into the next session on Image India. Thank you, sir.